Uh, thank you everyone for attending at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday evening. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so uh, without further ado, today we'll be doing ECGs uh, focusing on conduction delay and a couple of bit of uh, miscellaneous bits as well. Um, so for those who haven't met me, my name is Rich. I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. Um, and just before we start, just want to introduce you to our website. So Bite Medicine website, um, three sort of main areas that we, we focus on. Uh, one is our webinars. Uh, so you know, you've all managed to navigate your way here, which is fantastic. Um, so we try to do these um, as often as possible, usually aiming up to once a week. Um, we also have a question bank, which you can see on your screen now, which um, is a multi-step SBA format. So essentially you're given uh, a case and then it talks you through uh, a series of questions that take you on, on the journey of a, of a single patient. Um, and that's sort of how we like to structure our webinars as well. Um, we also then have an accompanying online textbook, which is ever growing uh, and is ratified by a number of different consultants in, in specialist fields. Um, so this is the ECG series. Um, for those who haven't attended our previous ones, they're all available for free on our website. So if you missed the basics with Schwab or the tachybradyarrhythmia arrhythmia um, session with myself, then uh, please do go check those out. They're all accessible uh, through our website or on YouTube. Um, and if you haven't yet made a premium subscription, but you wanted to, you can use my um, promo code Richard2021 for a 20% uh, discount. Okay. So the aim of today is to, uh, in hopefully 50 minutes, cover um, conduction delay. And I'd just like to draw your attention to the right hand side of this screen. Um, today's Menti code is going to be 4710. 9612. I'll post that in the chat. So that's going to be for menti.com, which is where I'll be um, posting our questions for today. And you can participate um, by answering those SBAs um, sort of live. Um, so without further ado, then, so I just wanted to briefly begin by having a chat about um, the electrical conduction system of the heart. So just starting with the sinoatrial node, this is um, found in the uh, right atrium um, and essentially is what uh, is we refer to as the pacemaker of the heart. It, it um, initiates electrical activity that then spreads by internodal pathways across the atria and to the atrioventricular node. And it is that electrical activity, that depolarization that is detected on an ECG as a P wave. Okay, so we're starting with the basics here. Um, from the AV node, um, it then travels down uh, the um, Purkinje fibers and the, the, the bundle of Hiss down towards the ventricles. Um, and that ventricular depolarization that occurs um, is shown as a QRS complex. Okay. And just going into the nomenclature a little bit more, the Q wave. Um, is described as the first downward deflection after the P wave. Okay, so this is important later on when we'll see some different sort of QRS morphologies. Um, and your R wave is the first upward deflection after the P wave. So you can actually have an R without any Q. Okay, so it could be an, an RSR pattern, for example. Um, and then that S wave is the final thing, which is the um, downward deflection that occurs after an R wave. Uh, and then finally, then you get that repolarization of the ventricles that occurs slightly after, um, which is uh, shown on an ECG as your T wave. So that's a really brief summary of PQRST. I want to launch straight into our first question. So uh, with ECGs, it's a little bit more complicated, um, but essentially um, I'll show you this question and I'll guide you to um, menti.com in a second. Um, and then I'll show you an ECG. So. Um, the question for today um, is, what abnormal finding is present on the following ECG that I'm about to show? And your options are first degree AV block, left bundle branch block, Mobitz type 1 AV block, Mobitz type 2 AV block, or right bundle branch block. So if you head over to menti.com, um, just 
share that here. So just a reminder, the code for Menti is 47109612. And the ECG that I would like you to interpret this question for is here. Take a nice long look, and the question is on menti.com. I'll give you just a few more moments and then we'll reveal what people are thinking. So we've got a bit of a split. So it seems like the majority of you think this is a first degree AV block with some thinking possibly Mobitz type two AV block. So let's have a look. Absolutely, majority wins. So well done. It is first degree AV block. So let's have a little chat about first degree. So Essentially, this ECG shows a prolonged PR interval of more than 0 0.2 seconds, okay, or five small squares or one big square. So that is the definition of a first degree AV block, essentially a prolonged PR interval. And this is consistently prolonged, okay. Um, so looking at this ECG, just down the, um, the bottom here, looking at this arrow, you can see that the beginning of the P wave to the QRS is just about a large box. So it's, it's just on the cusp of being um, more than 0 0.2 seconds, making it a first degree AV block. Um, and unfortunately the, uh, the animations haven't worked here, but I wanted to see what you guys think. Um, what additional ECG finding is shown in these circles here? And you can use the, the chat function just to post your, your ideas that you might have. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. So we've got a couple of people saying LAD, left axis deviation. Fantastic. Yeah. So really important ones to use. One and AVF, are they leaving each other, i.e. left axis deviation, or are they reaching towards each other, right axis deviation? So you're looking for either an overall positive deflection or an overall negative deflection. These two leads. So well done. Yes, yeah, so this is this ECG overall would show a prolonged PR interval and a left axis deviation. Well done. So just a little bit more about first degree AV block. So it's a delay without interruption in conduction from the atria to the ventricles. And it must be a PR interval of more than 0 0.2 seconds. It's deemed to be a benign issue. OK, so if you ever see it on an ECG, you don't really need to worry too much. It's not associated with hemodynamic compromise um, and there is no specific treatment that's required. However, there's a number of different causes of why someone would have it. Um, the most common being a normal variant. Okay, so some people might just have it. You're more likely to have it if you're an athlete versus someone that's non-athletic. However, there are a couple of pathological causes um, and we actually see these um, same pathological causes uh, creep up in all of the different AV blocks we're going to cover today. So um, inferior myocardial infarction, so specifically the inferior um, for these um, types of AV blocks because the RCA, which is responsible for the inferior territory, is also the artery that supplies the atrioventricular node. So any damage to that area can um, sort of delay uh, conduction. Certain um, dyselectrolytemias like hyperkalemia can cause it. Um, myocarditis, particularly from uh, Lyme disease, um, and then any drug that essentially is going to delay conduction or have some sort of um, uh, impact on the AV node, such as beta blockers, digoxin, or um, uh, cardioselective calcium channel blockers like verapamil, they can all cause it. But as I say, even if you have it, it's not really cause for concern. So question two, so I'll just... Um, take you back to um, Menti. I'll set the question up and then uh, make sure the results are hidden this time. So the question is, 
Which of the following is true about Mobitz type one AV block? So this is second degree AV block, Mobitz type one. Again, the same code we're using. And the options are asymptomatic patients still require pacing. It is a sporadic block of atrial impulses to the ventricles. It would be highly concerning to see on an ECG of an athlete. The interval between P waves is unchanged and there is a moderate risk of progression to complete heart block. Got five options there to choose from. Okay, so let's see where people are voting. So massive split here. That's fantastic. Okay, so we've got the the split majority on the interval between P waves is unchanged and there is a moderate risk of progression to complete heart block. So let's have a look at correct answer. So it is the interval between P waves is unchanged. So if we head back to the slides and we can have a bit of a chat about this one. So just working down the options. So pacing is not indicated for a patient with Mobitz type one AV block. Okay, if they're asymptomatic, pacing is not required. Um, likewise, with, with option two, rather than, than it be a random sporadic block that occurs, with Mobitz type one, it is a progressive slowing and, and fatigue of your atrioventricular node that leads to a block. So it's getting more and more tired and suddenly it can't conduct. And then it goes back and then it does the same thing. And we'll have a look at it in a bit more detail in a second. Um, with regards to athletes, no athletes can also end up with Mobitz type one AV block, a bit like with the first degree AV block. Um, and it, you know, it shouldn't be too concerning. The correct answer is the interval between P waves is unchanged. So your, eight, your sinoatrial node is still beating away, you know, producing those depolarizations at a lovely pace but it's the conduction to the ventricles that's the issue. So it's that PR interval is becoming longer and longer. So it's not that the P wave interval changes, it's the PR interval. Um, and finally, Mobitz type one, a bit like first degree, is considered fairly benign and has a very low progression to complete heart block. So if we look at it in a bit more detail, so it's a not a sporadic, but a progressive prolongation of the PR interval that eventually culminates in a non-conducted P wave. So a P wave that is not succeeded by a QRS complex. So this is sometimes known as the Wenkeback or Wenkeback phenom phenomenon, which is essentially that your PR interval is longest immediately before a failure to conduct, so a drop beat. And immediately after that drop beat, your PR interval is at its shortest. So you can see it down here you've got P wave, QRS, P wave longer, QRS, P wave even longer to the QRS than uh, a missed beat. So there's, there's a P wave here, but unfortunately the only sort of uh, free open access ECGs I could get, uh, there's no P wave um, available, but there would be a P wave here. It would fail to conduct and then it goes back to a short P wave. So the way you remember it is longer, longer, longer drop. Um, so that's te that tends to be what happens with uh, a wonky back. Um, it's usually due to a uh, reversible conduction block at the AVN. Um, so they progressively uh, fatigue and it's the AVN cells that the issue is the issue. Now, we're going to see in a second that with Mobitz type 2, it tends to be the his Purkinje system. So a little bit lower down in the pathway uh, where things go wrong. And again, it is a benign uh rhythm so some of the, the the problems that we saw last time with uh first degree av block again we are seeing with this second degree av block mobits type one so athletes inferior mi myocarditis etc all right um, so actually when it comes to av block the remembering the causes is it's quite simple um, so that is mobits type one
And here's just an ECG of it. You know, for those who downloaded the slides, you can just see it in full. Longer, longer, longer drop, longer, longer, longer drop. Lovely. So on to question three. So I'll take you back to uh, Menti. So you can see it in that format. So the question is, which of the following is true about Mobitz type 2 AV block? So our options are, it can arise due to infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. It carries a risk of progressing to PEA cardiac arrest. That's pulseless electrical activity. It is most commonly associated with inferior MIs. It is associated with right bundle branch block. And there is a low risk of progression to complete heart block. So which of the following is true? see what you guys have gone for. Oof, it's another split. Okay. So it's either a difficult topic or these questions are um, poorly worded. Let's, let's see. So the answer in this case is A, it can arise due to infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. So let's head back to the PowerPoint and uh, we can have a talk through these options. So Starting with the correct answer. So Borrelia is the causative organism in Lyme disease. So one of the complications of Lyme disease is you can get Lyme carditis. So essentially the infection gets to the heart and particularly can have either cause muscle inflammation or conduction defects, uh, particularly um, sort of uh, AV blocks and things like that. Um, it can, it does carry quite a significant risk of cardiac arrest, but the particular type that it would cause is asystole. So if you think um, that in Mobitz type 2, it's a conduction problem, you're going to end up with potentially asystole rather than pulseless electrical activity. So in pulseless electrical activity, you've still got a lovely normal PQRST going on, um, whereas you don't with, um, with asystole. It's just, it's a sort of almost flat line. Um, it's most commonly associated with inferior MI. So we saw with first degree AV block and with um, Mobitz type 1 that inferior MI is strongly implicated because of the fact that the right coronary artery supplies the AV node. In Mobitz type 2, the pathophysiology is essentially that your his Purkinje system, so the bundles, um, are uh, having, uh, that's where the pathology lies. And so those are found in the septum. So it's actually more anterior MIs, so things that are going to affect the septum that can lead to a Mobitz type 2 picture. Um, it's actually associated with left bundle branch. So your left bundle branch, there's two fascicles. On the right, there's just one. So if you've got complete left bundle branch block, then all it would take is failure of that single right bundle and then suddenly you've got a failure to conduct. Okay, And if that's an intermittent failure, then what will happen is you will get a um, sudden failure to conduct um, sporadically. Um, so you can often see, and we'll see on the ECG overleaf, that Mobitz type 2 is associated with a left bundle branch pattern. And Mobitz type 2 is concerning. So there is a moderate risk of progression to complete heart block. And so patients who present with, say, a bradycardia plus a Mobitz type 2 picture should be treated via the ALS algorithm with you know, atropine and, and various sort of pacing um, sort of options available. So just going through it again, sporadic block of atrial impulses to the ventricles without that progressive prolongation that we saw with Mobitz type 1. Um, it's a structural issue, okay, so problems with the bundles themselves. Um, and like we said, typically patients will have left bundle branch block and then this intermittent failure of the right bundle. It may be that this intermittent failure 
occurs in a pattern. So for example, every other um, sort of impulse doesn't get through, that would be a two to one, or every sort of third doesn't get through, um, or it may be no pattern at all. Um, but you do need to consider it uh, you know, and treat it very seriously. Uh, so here we've uh, included your, um, your causes, so slightly different to the, the previous ones we looked at. So here it's anterior MI because of the septum involvement um, and um, also cardiac surgery. So any cardiac surgery that's particularly kind of focusing on the septum, um, which is obviously where your Hespikinji system is running, could, um, could lead to damage. Um, and I just wanted to briefly cover this term that you may come across in the kind of clinical setting, so high-grade AV block. And it's a bit of a nebulous term that has a number of different definitions. So the, probably the simplest definition to hold on to is high-grade AV block is a second-degree AV block. So that could be Mobitz type 1 or type 2, where your P to QRS ratio is of 3 to 1 or higher. So essentially... Um, for every um, three P waves, only one gets conducted. So, if, and if it was for every four P waves, you have only one gets conducted. That's really bad. That's going to produce a significant and severe bradycardia, um, and it could potentially get to a point where your cardiac output is going to shoot down. So, so high grade AV block. That's probably the simplest definition to go off. Wow. So I'll just leave that slide up just for a moment. We had a question, someone just asked me, uh, what does PEA stand for? So pulseless electrical activity. It's one of your, your four arrest rhythms. Brilliant, okay. So moving on. So, so before, just briefly, I just wanted to show you an example of a um, uh, Mobitz type two ECG. So it's just essentially the PR interval is, is constant, but you get this, random miss sort of missed beat where the p wave just doesn't conduct into a qrs um, but there's no lengthening so it's it's really important um that you know the difference between a mobitz type one and a mobitz type two come your exams and you could just have two ecgs next to each other and you could say yep i know which one's which um an extra clue is we've discussed that in your um Mobitz type two, it's associated with left bundle branch block. And one of the easiest ways to spot a left bundle branch, um, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail later, is a broad QRS. And as you can see here, we've got a broad QRS. So that immediately should make you think, oh, this could be a Mobitz type two, because I know that's associated with bundle branch. So before we move on to bundle branch blocks, I just wanted to run through complete heart block with you. So this is defined as a severe bradycardia that arises due to complete sort of miscommunication with the sinoatrial node, the AV node, and the, the ventricles. So it's this AV node to ventricles are just not talking to one another. Um, you might hear it referred to as third degree heart block. So we had our first degree, then we had our second degree split into Mobitz type one and two, and then finally third degree or complete heart block. Um, so atria cannot conduct. And so what happens is that your cells in the Hispokinji system or in the ventricles that have automaticity, so essentially have the ability to generate um, pacemaker impulses, do so because the sinoatrial node is no longer telling them to do. Um, but the rate in which they do that is much less than the sort of sinoatrial node that's somewhere between 70 and 90. They're much more sort of uh, lower rate based somewhere between 40, 50. Um, and as a result, you're immediately going to have a uh, bradycardic um, ECG. So that, that ability for cells distally to the AVN to take over is, is sometimes known as a junctional escape rhythm. Um, and just like with Mobitz type 2, you, you have a very high risk of going into a cardiac arrest and it requires urgent management per the ALS algorithm for bradyarrhythmias. Main causes, I've kept it really simple. And the two kind of key things is make sure you look at the drug chart and are they on some sort of polypharmacy cocktail that could be causing um, sort of, sort of uh, interruption of that AV node? Um, at, or could it be that they've had a massive uh, inferior MI that's damaged their AV node so much that you've lost all communication um, 
to, between atria and ventricles. And here's an example. Um, so if you look with these arrows, I've, I've drawn them on. So these are the atrial impulses, okay? Now they're occurring regularly. So the interval between P waves is the same. And then if you look at the QRSs, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six on a trace, producing a much slower rate. And there's absolutely no torque between P waves and QRSs. It's not like there's a Vankerback phenomenon or some sporadic failure. It is just they're completely unrelated to one another. So that is a complete heart block um, ECG. And just, uh, we mentioned this in our Tacky Brady um, uh, webinar a couple of weeks ago, but I just wanted to reintroduce it here. So if you're faced with a bradycardia in A&E or, you know, on the wards, um, first thing to do is make sure, you know, look for any adverse features. And these are the same, whether it's a tachy or a brady. So shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia and heart failure. If they have it, then it's an immediate indication for atropine. Um, if they don't have it, however, then you still assess or are they at a greater risk of developing asystole cardiac arrest, in which case you would treat them with atropine or some other measure like isoprenaline or, or temporary pacing anyway. And these, these asystole risks are, have they had asystole before? Do they have Mobitz type 2 AV block, which we said was you know, a risky um, ECG to have, complete heart block, so third degree heart block, or a ventricular pause of more than three seconds. And if they have any of them, then you would basically treat them the same as if they had adverse features and you involve the cardiologist ASAP. Okay, so um, I'll just leave the slide up for a second, but just to say for those who weren't aware, um, all of our slides are available for download um, on the website in the watch section. So you'll be able to you know, get these and, and annotate them during the session or later, should you wish. So um, here's a summary of AV blocks before we move on. So um, first degree, it's a delay without interruption in conduction from the atrium to the ventricles characterized as uh, more than 0 0.2 seconds. Mobitz type one, we said it was that progressive prolongation of the PR interval that eventually culminates in a non-conductive P wave. Mobitz type two, it was a sporadic block due to a structural issue with the Hispokinji system and associated usually with a left bundle branch block pattern. And finally, complete heart block, that severe bradycardia that arises due to complete absence of AV conduction to the ventricles. So there's a nice little summary slide for you there. I'll just give you guys just a minute um, just before we move on to the next section of the webinar. Okay, brilliant. So back to Menti. So um, as before, so uh, let's set this up. So the question, um, question is, what abnormal finding is present on the following ECG that I'll show you in a second? Is it first degree AV block? left bundle branch block, Mobitz type one AV block, Mobitz type two AV block, or right bundle branch block. And here is the ECG. So let's see what you guys are voting on. Okay, wow, nine to one. So you're all very confident with your with which way around your bundle branches are. Fantastic, yeah, left bundle branch block. So let's head back and have a bit of a chat about LBBVs. So 
obviously it was very unlikely that this was going to be an AV block given that we'd sort of put that section of the webinar to bed. Um, so really it sort of came down to a choice between uh, left bundle branch and right bundle branch. Um, and I'm sure you, know, you all have your own ways of recognizing them. Um, and we'll talk through a couple of different ways that you can be confident every time in getting it right and, and the right way around. Um, but essentially in that ECG, it had broad QRS complexes, deep S waves in V1 and broad R waves in the lateral leads. So remember R waves are those um, positive deflections that come after a P wave. S waves are the negative deflections that come after an R wave. So the key diagnostic criteria that you, you should remember if you're ever faced with sort of a, an SBA that asks you to literally um, you know, pick them out. So it's a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. And essentially, the reason for that is one of your two bundles are blocked. Then in order for your ventricles to depolarize and contract, it relies on the other bundle. So you get electrical conduction going down one of the bundles and then across to the other side, which causes uh, ventricular depolarization to occur over a longer period of time, causing a broader QRS complex. You also get a deep S wave in V1 and a much more prominent R wave in the lateral leads, which you can see down here. Um, and we'll have a bit of a chat on the next few slides about why those occur and how you can actually figure it out in real time. Some just facts about it. So many people will have left bundle branch with absolutely no symptoms. Um, the main symptom, if any, is syncope. So um, if, for example, you get, you've got left bundle branch and then you also get an intermittent um, failure of the right bundle branch, then your ventricles may not contract because they're not told to. Um, and then you may briefly lose cardiac output leading to syncope. Um, Presence of symptoms plus a left bundle branch may indicate that you need a pacemaker and presence of a poor ejection fraction. So essentially heart failure plus left bundle branch block um, is an indication for a variety of different devices that I will plan to cover with you guys in our fourth and final session on ECGs in two weeks time. Um, I've put down here new left bundle branch block does not equate to myocardial ischemia. So um, it used to be the case that if you saw a left bundle branch block on an ECG in someone that presented with chest pain, um, then you would um, immediately assume that that's a sort of ischemic change. Um, it might be, um, but what uh, they encourage you to use now is this modified Scarboza criteria to help um, diagnose um, MIs in the presence of a left bundle branch because when you have this left bundle branch pattern and kind of already problems with your electrical conduction systems, um, your T waves don't necessarily obey the normal patterns that you would expect. It's called disconcordant pattern. Um, and it's an appropriate response to having a left bundle branch. So actually, um, oftentimes when you're looking for ischemia in someone with a left bundle branch, it's if you see appropriate um, concordance, so the T waves are you know, looking normal as they would in anybody else, that might be a concern, but this goes way beyond the scope of any medical school exam. So I wouldn't really worry about it other than to just know that it is a thing. So some common causes. So one of the most common ones would be any kind of ischemic heart disease that can damage your bundle, uh, bundle branch. Um, hypertension can cause it, dilated cardiomyopathy, there's this rare condition um, sort of known as Lev's disease or Linegre Lev, um, which is essentially where your electrical conduction system becomes fibrosed. So um, instead of it being able to conduct electricity, it no longer can. Um, again, Lyme carditis can cause it and also aortic stenosis. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, causes that you can go away and learn. So just looking at the electrical conduction system. So if you were to get a block on your left bundle branch, then as we've said, all of the electrical conduction that gets to the ventricles would go via the right bundle and then spread out from the apex across to the left bundle. And that's what we said causes that widening of the QRS complex. And what I wanted to show you here was um, something that I found really, really useful when thinking about um, left bundle branch block. So, 
if you've blocked your left, then the overall initial vector will be this downwards arrow because overall your right bundle is taking over. So there's a shift in the vector. And then across from the right ventricle, across the septum to the left ventricle. Now, when electrical activity or when a vector goes towards V6, which is going to be on the sort of lateral aspect of your chest, when any vector goes directly towards a lead, you get a positive deflection in that lead. So if you can think through this schematic and you think, right, my left bundle is blocked, so the vector is going to go downwards first and then across, that's going to produce a wide QRS, and where that vector is moving towards, i.e. V6, which is on the left lateral position, I'm going to get a positive deflection, which is exactly what happens in a left bundle branch ECG. So you get this massive upwards deflection, followed by a um, downwards um, in V6, and then the converse in V1. So you get this deep S wave as the vector moves away from V1, which is obviously much more over towards the sort of right side of your chest. So I found that a really useful um, way of thinking about it. I think it's actually um, quite a um, sort of logical way. If your brain doesn't work like that, which is completely fine, then you can rely on the good old William Marrow, um, which is, it doesn't work in every case, but it can do. So essentially the first thing you need to do is write out William Marrow. Now the L in William stands for left bundle and the R in Marrow stands for right bundle. So that's what you're using to determine if it's a left bundle or a right bundle branch. And in the case of a left bundle branch, you're looking in V1, you're looking for possibly a W sign. And in V6, this M sign, which is known as a notched R wave. Okay, so overall an M in V6, that sort of upwards deflection um, is what we see in left bundle branch. Personally, I don't find William Marrow that helpful, um, but if it's something that works for you, then continue to use it. So, final question. Um, so, which of the following is not a feature of isolated right bundle branch block? So, what that means is just right bundle branch block on its own, no other bells and whistles. So, I'll take you back to the final question on Menti. So, our options are left axis deviation. QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds, an RSR pattern in V1 to 3, a slurred S wave in lead 1 and ABL, or a slurred S wave in V5 and V6. Let's see what you guys have gone for. Okay, spectacular. Brilliant stuff. So majority seem to have gone for left axis deviation, which is absolutely right. So all of those other ECG features could be expected, but may not be guaranteed, but could be expected to be seen in a right bundle branch block. So if we uh, return to PowerPoint, we have a bit of a chat about that. So I've laid it out the same way as left bundle branch. So we've got our key diagnostic criteria. Once again, we have got this QRS duration of 120 milliseconds. It's the same thing, okay? If you've blocked your right bundle, then in order for the ventricular uh, electrical activity to spread to the right ventricle, then it's got to go via the left bundle first, reaching kind of the apex of the left ventricle, and then across to your right ventricle, which is going to broaden your QRS. You get this RSR pattern in V1 to 3 um, and a wide slurred S wave in the lateral lead. So it's essentially, um, last time we saw that deep S wave in V1 in left bundle branch. This time we're seeing predominantly an upwards deflection. 
So some key facts, again, many people won't have symptoms with right bundle branch. It can lead to poor ejection fraction. The right bundle branch is supplied by the um, left anterior descending perforators. So um, there's some new evidence that suggests that if you get a new right bundle branch block, it could be highly concerning for what is called occlusion myocardial infarction. So a little bit of reading basically suggests that not all completely occluded arteries always yield a, an ST elevation like picture or STEMI. Um, so this new term occlusion myocardial infarction um, basically suggests that if you get an occlusion in your proximal LAD, you might just yield a new right bundle branch block. This is more academic than kind of, you know, clinical at this point, um, but just something uh, worth uh, mentioning. Somebody's asked me about what I mean by RSR. So essentially, um, it's you get an initial depolarization of the left ventricle because it gets there first, and then a greater depolarization that represents a culmination of left ventricle and right ventricle uh, depolarizing together. So R, S, and then R again, a bigger R. Uh, so some causes. So these are important. Uh, so right ventricular hypertrophy, um, a pulmonary embolus. Um, so if you ever see a right bundle branch block pattern on an ECG of someone that's you know, querying a PE, then you could suggest that maybe they've got some sort of right ventricular strain going on um, and it's damaging their kind of uh, conduction system. So that's, um, that's something really important to be aware of, um, particularly in OSCEs at the moment. So um, uh, I remember in one of my OSCEs in uh, uh, clinical years, I had a, a patient um, that was a mock-up of a pulmonary embolism and we were given an ECG and you're not just looking for sinus tachycardia, you're also looking for those other slightly niche features like evidence of right ventricular strain um, or you know, the uh, S1, Q3, T3 pattern as well. Once again, um, Lev's disease is always going to be correct because it could just be that you get some part of your conduction system becomes fibrosed. So once again, with the schematics, so this time we've got the right bundle branch becomes blocked so we become reliant on the left bundle now as a result of that your initial vector goes from avn towards the left ventricle and then across via the septum to the right uh, ventricle so this time if we look at this sort of second arrow you've got the vector moving away from v6 which will lead to a negative deflection in V6 and sort of towards V1, which is why you get that positive deflection in V1. So we get positive in V1, we get this deep slurred sort of S wave here in V6. So that's just something I found that really useful when I'm thinking about left and right bundle branches. I think, okay, which way is the overall vector going to be going? Which way is it going to, is it going to be moving towards V6 or away from it? If it's towards it, then overall you'll have an upwards deflection. If it's away from it, you're more likely to have any sort of mid or, or downward deflection. Um, and I, I just personally find that very useful. If you don't, then you can use William Marrow. I think William, the Marrow section of William Marrow is a bit more useful. So particularly, so you're looking in V1, you're looking for an M sign, this RSR pattern, which represents initial depolarization of the left ventricle, and then a greater depolarization that is both left and right ventricle electrical activity. Um, and you may see a sort of W sign here with this QR and then slurred S wave pattern here. So marrow, I think, works a little bit better um, for looking for right bundle branches, uh, right bundle branch blocks. Okay, so before we finish, it is slightly more complicated than simply left and right. So the left bundle is actually further divided into two fascicles, okay, an anterior and a posterior fascicle. Now, what you can have is something called bifascicular block, which is essentially where you get complete block of your right bundle and then a left hemi block. So one of your two fascicles, either the anterior or the posterior fascicle, becomes blocked. So 
in that case, you're going to have two patterns. You're either going to have a right bundle branch with right bundle branch block with a left anterior fascicular block, or a right bundle branch block with a left posterior fascicular block. The one that I would recommend learning is the anterior one. So it's much more common to get an anterior fascicular block simply because the anterior fascicle has a single blood supply, whereas the posterior fascicle has dual blood supply. So if you get occlusion of one of the two arteries, the other one might be able to, you know, keep keep the fascicle going. If you've got a right bundle branch block plus left anterior fascicular block, your ECG will show classic right bundle branch block pattern and a left axis deviation. Left anterior, left axis deviation. That's the way to remember it. Whereas in posterior fascicular block, which is the one we said is rarer, you get a right axis deviation. And causes are very similar to the ones we previously looked at for right bundle branch block. Um, just to say new onset of bifascicular block is very indicative of a proximal LAD occlusion. So if you, if you saw it, you know, the, uh, you know, an ECG on admission didn't have anything and then, you know, your patient starts complaining of chest pain and has a new bifascicular block, be worried, act quickly, call the cardiologist. So this is an example of a bifascicular block. So we've got our RSR pattern in V1 and that sort of slid S wave in V6. So this indicates um, a right bundle branch pattern. And then on top of that, we're looking at leads one and AVF and they're leaving each other, which is left axis deviation. Uh, and there's just a nice summary there of how to remember right and left axis deviation. So right reaching towards each other, left leaving uh, leaving each other. Fab. And so finally, just to finish, we've got this tiny section on trifascicular block. So I'm sure you can imagine this is where you get block in your right bundle, your left anterior fascicle, and your left posterior fascicle. I've seen one um, that was on my time in cardiology, so um, I can't really comment on how uh, common they are. The the definition varies, and that often actually limits how much you can be um, assessed in the exams on it. So that the, a true trifascicular block is essentially a bifascicular block pattern uh, on an ECG plus complete heart block. Because if all of your fascicles have been delayed or damaged, then you're not going to be having any talk between atria and ventricles, which is what we said was our definition of complete heart block. And once again, the causes are the same as any of these other fascicular blocks, but obviously you've got much wider spread disease for all fascicles to be involved. Um, so you may see um, some people or some kind of textbooks may uh, describe it as trifascicular block as bifascicular plus a first or second degree AV block. That's a clinical misnomer. Um, and so the true definition is bifascicular block plus complete heart block for the reasons that I uh, said above. Uh, and I've also said because there's a bit of a kind of um, sort of sketchy definition, uh, it's rare for you to be examined on it. But it's just something nice to know should you get quizzed uh, on the wards. And that is essentially the end of the session. Um, so I hope you found it useful. I'm happy to stay and answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, if you're too shy, then you can either tweet me, you can email me, um, you can email Bite Medicine, you can join our website and stay up to date with everything that we have going on. Um, but yeah, I hope you uh, all enjoyed it. And uh, if you uh, do want to, uh, to join up, please use um, uh, my personal promo code Richard2021 for 20% off. Somebody's asked about uh, right ventricular strain. Um, so it's essentially, um, uh, you'd expect to see um, right bundle branch block would be one of the, the main features of that. Um, and I think also uh, you get a poor progression of the R waves. So essentially through V1 to 6, they don't build and get higher and higher. Um, 
Someone's asked, could you explain Mobitz type two versus complete heart block again and how to differentiate them? Yeah, absolutely. So complete heart block, you've got your atria plugging along nicely at their classic rate of between sort of 70 and 90 um, along the bottom of the ECG. And then you've got your ventricles relying on their junctional escape rhythm that are also firing at their rate of say 50. And there is no crosstalk, there's no pattern that suggests that the P wave is talking to those QRSs. They're completely unrelated, completely different ratios. It can be hard actually just from a single 10 second trace to tell the difference. Whereas Mobitz type two, what you're expecting is P QRS, P QRS, P, and then a misfire. But as you go from PQRS to PQRS to misfire, the PR intervals aren't getting any longer. And we said with Mobitz type two, one of the key things you can look out for is a um, left uh, bundle branch block pattern. Um, and then it's that intermittent failure of the right bundle that would cause essentially a, miss, a sort of failure to conduct. Um, so yeah, good question. Well, thank you guys for all attending. Um, if, uh, you know, if you enjoyed it and you want to watch it again, this will be uploaded in a couple of days onto the website. Please tell, you know, your friends to sign up. Um, yeah, brilliant. Someone's asked, uh, so what's the difference between synchronized and unsynchronized cardio version? And when would you uh, use each? So for synchronized, this is used for um, sort of tachy uh, arrhythmia. So if, for example, they have a, an adverse feature like shock or heart failure, um, then you need to give synchronized um, cardio version, but you need to make sure that you deliver the shock at the right time to try and cardio it and shock them back into um, a, a sinus rhythm. If you shock on the wrong moment, you can actually make things a lot worse um, and potentially cause like a, a V-fib pattern. Um, and in the case of unsynchronized cardioversion, this is essentially an arrest situation where, you know, you've just got to deliver the shock because, you know, there's a possibility that you will if it's a shockable rhythm, um, restore a um, elect, let, you know, regular sinus rhythm. And someone said, what do you mean by reaching towards each other and away from each other in uh, axis deviation? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I'll just go back. Um, so looking here, you lose, use leads one and AVF as your main um, leads when looking to see if there's a deviation. Um, so if the overall... Um, deflection of the um, lead is upwards, i.e. in lead one, it's definitely an upwards from the isoelectric line, and in AVF, it's clearly downwards, then you would say that it's one is moving away from AVF, and AVF is also moving away from one. So they're moving away from each other. In normal times, your AVF would, should actually be pointed upwards, so they're kind of going in the same direction. Um, so when they're leaving each other, that's a left axis deviation. And then in right axis deviation, it's your lead one that tends to be the issue. So it's pointing downwards. So overall negative deflection and your ABF reaching up, that's a right axis deviation. Hope that was helpful. Thank you. I'll stay around for five more minutes, guys, if you've got any more questions. Um, otherwise, I'll put the contact details section. You can, uh, you can email or tweet me um, should you have any more questions.